Well, good morning. Thank you all so much for joining us today, ladies. Um, as you probably know, I'm really super excited uh, to bring back my good friend, John Wind from Philadelphia. He really doesn't need an introduction if you're here. It's because he's, he means something to you on some level. And uh, he definitely means something to David and I. And so we are thrilled to have him back. Um, and he also brought Bill. Bill, can you wave? Bill's going to be our <laughs> photographer. Bill is John's fiance and uh, has become a, a fast friend over the last couple of years. And so he actually got to make the trip uh, with us uh, to experience Round Top and Warrington. And uh, so that we could do all of our fun antique buying and digging. And so the uh, bar is going to have some of those things. John will talk to you about that. But we're going to jump right in. And I'm going to let John start his program. You just keep eating. If you need something you know, to drink, um, you just motion one of the girls will kind of be watching. But we're going to give John the floor. And we're going to enjoy his presentation. And I know you're, you're going to love it. And uh, so with that said, welcome, sweet guy. Oh, my God. <laughs> Thank you, Lori. When Lori and I met, we think it's eight years ago, at the Dallas uh, gift market, and it was just like this instant connection. Fashion, art, family, tradition, uh, creativity, thinking outside the box. And I think I've told you guys this before, but you know, I've sold to over a thousand stores uh, in my career, and Lori is one of just a small handful who does things like this, who has this kind of think outside the box vision to you know, create special opportunities for her, for her VIP customers and um, bring, you know, bring me down to Carn City, Texas <laughs> <laughs> three times now. <laughs> um, it's just really gratifying. You know, it, make, it makes me feel so good and um, I'm so glad to be able to uh, share my story with you. Lori, thank you for once again, you know, make some magic happen. So as the years go by, I, my, uh, my personal journey as an artist and as a jewelry designer keeps evolving. So the, the things that I told you four or five years ago have, have evolved since then. Um, the biggest evolution is that it used to be all about jewelry. Now I'm really balancing my life between three different things. My jewelry uh, design, um, my art, and this is a, my other art. Jewelry is an art too, I don't want to take it away from it. But I've been doing a lot of portraiture um, over the last few years, and I'm gonna show you some images um, in a few minutes. But if you're wondering what this uh, suitcase is sitting here, this is an example that I shipped down of what, what a portrait means to me. And that is, it's an accumulation of objects that have emotional meaning uh, to us and that represent the person who the portrait is of. So I've done portraits of families, I've done portraits of my niece at 16 years old and now at 19. This is a portrait of my grandfather who passed away 25 years ago. He owned a men's clothing store in Israel and um, when he passed away, I took all these things from the store, not knowing what I would do with them, just knowing that you know, I, I loved them and I loved um, the memories that they evoked. As I got into this idea of portraiture through objects, I pulled out the box where, that I'd been saving, and it all kind of came together. So the portraiture uh, and sculpture is the second piece of my, my world. And the third is that um, I run an art foundation that our family created in my mom's memory. And I'm also going to show you a little bit more and tell you about that foundation. So very different um, portfolio, if you will, than, um, than when you and I met. Right. But it's, it's just keeping life really exciting, and uh, you know, there's, a, there's a lot of new challenges and opportunities around every corner. So some of you have never heard my story before. For those of you who have, I hope you'll find something new in it and just enjoy these fun photos, starting with me as a, a five-year-old, four-year-old. I always loved art and somehow knew that art was going to be part of my life. So that's uh, my mom in the corner. I'm playing with color forms, which I think are still a thing, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then, um, I, well, I was born in Israel, where my parents were born and raised. But we moved to the United States when I was three. My dad um, got a PhD at Stanford University in California in business uh, marketing, and then got an offer to teach at the University of Pennsylvania. 
So that, that got us to Philadelphia, where I've been, um, with the two-year exception when I went away to art school, um, I've been in Philly ever since, since 1968. Um, I did go to art school in London, though, in the early 80s, and that was uh, a big chance to kind of get away and you know, find myself and find my creative voice. And it was, so that picture is me in my art school uh, studio. And I was trying to figure out, am I a painter, am I a sculptor? My mom was already an artist and she was a sculptor, so that kind of came naturally to me, this idea of assembling objects. But um, I was also a club kid, having fun going out at night. Um, and I started making jewelry, these found object brooches, uh, double brooches, for myself and my friends to wear when we went out to nightclubs. And it was just one of those faded moments where people were really intrigued with the jewelry. They were asking, you know, where did I get it? Um, I met the Thompson twins who in 1983 were like the hot, raise your hand if you knew the Thompson twins. <laughs> the Thompson twins in the early 80s, them and Culture Club were like the biggest yeah. bands um, in, in the world and both out of London. And um, just through some connections, I met the Thompson twins. They ended up buying a whole bunch of my jewelry. These double brooches were wow. our signature then, uh, or my signature then. And they wore them on their album cover that year. They wore them out in concert. Um, one of the special things I brought with me today are some of the vintage pieces that I made back in the 80s, in the early 80s. And on the trays over there, there are two double brooches, circa 1985. Um, available for purchase, so that was kind of exciting. And also some belts, and Lori's wearing one of my cowboy belts from like 1987. So, you know, I love vintage things, but it's a little sobering to realize that my own design is now vintage. <laughs> you know, which is weird since I'm only 40 years old. Right, right. Um, okay, so. I just started going with the flow and realizing that this jewelry thing, that you know, there was a possi there were possibilities here. And when an artist graduates from art school, it's like, okay, what do you do now? Are you going to be a teacher? Like, how do you support yourself? It's really unrealistic that you could, you know, right out of the box, support yourself as a painter or a sculptor. But somehow, jewelry was different because, well, women love jewelry, and uh, some men too, but it was mostly women and. Uh, this whole world of retail, fashion boutiques, gift shops, you know, I found my way into a, a market that I, I'd never even heard of, but within a couple of years, um, for the first five years with a, a dear friend from college, we started a company together. The brand was called Maximal Art, and uh, we were really uh, hot for, you know, for, in retrospect for a second, but for those first five years were kind of amazing. We. Um, we were selling, well, locally we sold through the Dallas Apparel Mart, and uh, we won an award, Best <coughs> Accessory Designers of the Year. We were selling to Neiman Marcus, to Stanley Korshak, wow. to Harrods in London, to uh, uh, Barney's in New York and around the country. I mean, it was just kind of unbelievable. Um, I met Andy Warhol, he photographed me. Oh, no. That's, uh, if you have time over a drink someday, I'll tell you the whole <laughs> Andy Warhol story, how that happened. Um, that, actually, that was me with orange hair, um, inspired by Annie Lennox from the Eurythmics, yes. another 80s touch. So that was, that was uh, early 80s. But the, and that's Hillary, my friend who I started the business with. There was that double brooch that was our signature. But then all of these brooches, just literally flea market finds. I mean, imagine my grandfather's portrait you know, reduced to a couple of inches. That's what I was doing. It's kind of wild that almost 40 years later, the aesthetic is the same. I just keep finding new ways to apply it. Um, we got a lot of press, Elle Magazine, Harper's Bazaar, internationally, that is a French fashion magazine. Th these watches became a thing, like just flea marketing one day, I found a vendor who had a box of old watch heads and uh, we played around with it and made a bracelet. So there were four watches, but none of them worked, so you still had to wear a watch. Because <laughs> <laughs> nobody had a, you know, a phone. But, but those multiple watch bracelets uh, became you know, a huge a huge thing for us. Did you bring one today? I don't have any multiple watches. Yeah, you're right, I was going to. We but, didn't, you showed yeah. it to me on the... 
This uh, Fragments was a, a rep, a wholesale repping company, and once I signed with them, they got, they took our line way beyond where we had been. And so, I mean, we were just, you know, in our mid twenties and had a multi-million dollar business. It was, it was insane. And you can see just so much attention. Okay. But then it didn't last. <laughs> and there should be like a black slide for what happened after this. Because around 1990, it all fell apart. And fashion had gone from maximal. I mean, I literally named my company after the trend of maximalism. I mean, I'm always maximal. But fashion went minimal. And uh, that wasn't good for business. <laughs> And um, there was a recession, so you know, people were cutting back and being more conservative. And it was like we were a trend, and the trend you know, ran its course. And because we were young and a little uh, cocky at that point, we didn't really handle it that well, and it took a while to uh, kind of catch our breath. <coughs> Hillary ended up moving on to a different career. She realized she was more interested in being a promoter of design than a maker. For me, I still liked making, and I and you know it was my. I just saw how this was my life's work to to make things, to connect with people. I mean, that was a really important part of it. It's not just you know sitting in a in a studio making things alone. It's making, but then being in stores, being in showrooms, connecting, uplifting people through jewelry. I mean, what, that's a gift to be able to do that for a living. So I was determined to figure it out. Those multiple watches turned into single watches that worked. <laughs> and uh, in the early 90s, uh, fortunately, that was still a viable category. The big uh, collage brooches, not so much. But watches were good. So we got into the watch business. This was a kind of exciting moment. Mark Jacobs, the fashion designer, he saw my watches at Barney's, and he reached out to me to design a collection for him. That particular season, he was doing these jackets with jewel-length sleeves. Is that what they're called? Jewel, some? Yeah. Anyway, these, these kind of cropped, almost like 1950s sleeves, where you would really see the watch, so he had this idea. So we were on the cover of Women's Wear Daily with that one. Then I somehow segued from that into this Victorian moment. Victoria Magazine was huge in the 1990s. Did any of you uh, subscribe to it or remember it? Lori, I bet you did. I did. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and so the Victorian trend, it, it really spoke to me in another way. This idea of sentiment in jewelry and how um, it wasn't so much a fashion thing, it was more about a gifting and sharing. And so, you know, literally pins that said sisters, queen mother, uh, a lot of word sentiments, and then also a lot of just pretty things like, um, that bracelet was paintings that a friend of mine did on antique uh, calligraphy. So a real vintage vibe. Underneath it were uh, pansies from my own uh, urban garden that I pressed and then mounted also on uh, antique calligraphy, on antique parchment paper, and then photographed them. So in those little bezels are um, photos of the pansies with teeny little crystals. We poured resin over the whole thing. They were really painstaking, beautiful little like shadow boxes. So that really picked up. And, um, and by the late 1990s, I, I'm proud to say I had really rebuilt the business, but in a whole new way, you know, selling more in this gift world than in the fashion world. Companies like Disney approached us. We met through trade shows that I was doing. Um, you know, the kind of jewelry that I was making really lent itself to imagery. So, I mean, Disney is the best imagery there is. So they asked if we could do jewelry using, you know, Mickey, and we ended up doing half a dozen different collections for them um, with different Disney characters, but always with that kind of vintage vibe and the resin over the images. So it was a really great fit. And at the time, the Walt Disney galleries were um, stores around the country, but for adults. It was like collectible Disney merchandise uh, geared to people like us, adult collectors, people like Bill, who loves Disney. <laughs> okay, moving on. Uh, in the early 2000s, fashion turned a corner again. 
and finally Maximal was back and <laughs> embellishment was back and accessories were back and people were like hungry for it because things had been pretty spare on the fashion front. So, you know, trying to be nimble, we decided to get back into fashion ourselves. But using kind of the vocabulary that I had developed over the past um, years, so like this was a great example. This is my homage to the world's great flea markets. It's called the Portobello Charm Necklace. Portobello Road in London was the first uh, flea market that I used to go to. And then it also includes uh, Klingon Court Paris, Brimfield Mass, uh, the Pas Pasadena Rose Bowl in California, and I didn't really know about Round Top then, so I'm sorry uh, <laughs> that I didn't include that, but I would have today. We got you as fast, there as fast as we yeah. yeah, right. <laughs> so I went back to Fragments, that rep who had helped us grow so much in the 80s, and um, they were game. She said that they hadn't sold a piece of costume jewelry in 15 years. It had all been fine jewelry. That's how they survived that, you know, the 90s. But we had a great run, and again, a lot of press and a lot of international stores. But this time around, I kind of knew that there was a life cycle to it, and that you know, for somebody like me who wants a lifelong career designing jewelry, to not get too hung up on the fashion piece, because it doesn't last. And literally, the point of fashion is that it's fashionable, and then it's not fashionable. So I kind of took it all with a grain of salt, but I you know, enjoyed the ride. And then something cool happened. We were approached by Anthropology, who we were doing some private label jewelry for, and they asked, uh, they, they said they wanted initial jewelry. So I hadn't really done initials. I had done words, you know, a full word, sister, mom. But the idea of just an initial, that was, that was a great idea. And uh, this company up in Rhode Island, where I bought a lot of uh, our, our supplies, they had these initials, these, well, you now, you all know them because you've seen them here for years, but we called them sorority gal initials because in, in the 50s and 60s when sororities were first, the first heyday, um, every young woman had to have one. And, you know, we, so it was our name for it. But the vendor, when I said I wanted to order some samples, he said, John, no one has ordered those in literally 30 years. And that's how I knew it was time for, you know, to make a comeback. So we put together these bracelets with the sorority gal initials and chunky chains and costume pearls, and it became a hit. <coughs> and Anthropology carried it. It was their top selling accessory that entire year. Um, the next year, uh, Oprah, one of the editors at Oprah, which, excuse me, at that moment, at that moment, Oprah was as big as as Victoria had been ten years earlier. Um, so they, they found us at another trade show and asked for samples, and then we became part of the Oprah gift guide that year when Oprah was at her absolutely most influential. So much to my surprise, suddenly I was the, the initial guy. And, you know, this is, do you feel like, it's like a roller coaster, this whole story. You know, you're hot, you're not, you're in fashion, you're out of fashion, you figure something else out, you've got a hot item. It's, it's kind of unbelievable. Um, but fortunately, there's you know opportunity keeps uh, appearing it, because people ask for things or I see things. We went to to uh, Round Top, and you know I'm always looking. Well, what's the next thing that I'm gonna you know figure out to reinvent? Um, it's it's kind of it's a nerve wracking but exciting journey. Charms became the next thing after initials, and I was using a lot of charms um, in my jewelry. But this was a little different because this was an opportunity for customers to make their own jewelry, to be like you know, a, a co-designer by using my raw materials, but then you get to tell your story. And that, that was like a little foreshadowing of where we're at as a culture now. You know, because of the internet, everything can be personalized. And, uh, and you have so much more say in, in the final look and the opportunity, if you want to, to, be, to, to design your own work. So we did the charm bars, the, the spread on the left, that was for anthropology. On the right, that's me at a store in Philadelphia, Joan Shep, a really beautiful, the Gypsy Lou's of Philadelphia. <laughs> <laughs> and you can see those white charm trays, that's what I've got here today still. So, you know, I kind of came up with this idea of the charm bar. 
uh, and it's it's been popular ever since, and it's really fun to keep uh, restocking it in new ways and to find more and more vintage things uh, mixed with initials. So it's so, so we that was how we, we found our way through the two thousands. Started to get um, well, I guess we've we've always had a good amount of press, but you know it just constantly there's a new new versions of it. So. Um, there was a fair amount of TV coverage. I was on QVC. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> you know, QVC is based in Phil outside of Philadelphia, so they, they talked to us a number of times over the years. And um, this particular time, we did a bracelet, the Southern Charm bracelet, because I was, because of those initials, we were more popular in the South than anywhere else in the country, because y'all love your initials. <laughs> 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 like my mother, who was, ooh, I just messed up. No. Okay. My mother, she would always say to me, I don't understand it. Why do you wear your own initial? Like, you know. <laughs> you know who you are. I'm like, Mom, we just don't understand. <laughs> I can't explain it to you. Anyway, so we did this uh, Southern Charm bracelet, and it was a, a sellout on QVC. Awesome. We tested some more things on QVC, and to be honest, it wasn't always a perfect fit because they were looking for you know really tight price points, huge volume. You know, if you didn't sell, we sold in seven minutes twenty five hundred bracelets. Oh, wow. That's a lot of expectation, and it doesn't always happen that way. And you know, it, it, it just put a kind of pressure on me as a designer that that really isn't the, the nature of my business. You know, I want it to be more artisan and more special. So I was happy for that experience. You know, and it was very lucrative. But um, in the long term, you need a different kind of business model to to be on QVC. That's sweet, and you were so tickled. Okay, but then you, you were ready to move on. <laughs> I think I got it. Thank you. <laughs> um, just before the pandemic, um, it was time to move on in another way, and that was that the business, as you could get the sense of, was getting bigger and bigger, and um, it was a lot of management and a lot of um, kind of being responsive to the marketplace and to trends, and you know those initial bracelets got us into. That was when we sold to the most stores ever, like over a thousand stores. But then, a tr trends are trends, and even the initial was a trend to some extent. So what's next? And then with all of those stores all over the country, they really wanted like the next trend. They didn't want necessarily John Wynn's art. It wasn't logical that I'd end up you know, with a portrait of my grandfather in 990 of those gift shops, boutiques, museum stores, hospital shops mail order catalogs, you know, it's just different. So we, 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 we rode that um, wave for a long time, but ultimately I was ready for a new chapter. And um, I sold the building that my business had been in. I parted ways with uh, a woman who was running the business side of things and who really helped me grow so much, Robin Cook. Um, and I bought with my father this amazing building in uh, South Philadelphia. Um, Two years prior to that, my mom, who I told you had been an artist, she passed away from ovarian cancer. And her old welding studio in Philadelphia was in a neighborhood that had really gotten pretty glamorous in the, in the 20 years since she bought there. So we sold her studio, we sold my studio, and with the combined resources, we bought this cool building which 100 years ago was the stable for a firehouse yeah. in South yeah. Philadelphia. Like <laughs> yeah, so you can see the big openings, yeah. and uh, it's, it's really beautiful, I have to say, these beam ceilings and, and wide plank floors. Um, I worked with a, an interior designer, long story, but anyway, I worked <laughs> with an interior designer who helped me renovate it, and I, when I told her that our tagline was modern vintage, she really got that, and you know, you can see it's this mixture. It's very clean, but it's also very vintage, and it really set the tone for uh, for the work that happens there. David and I went when you were there, uh, maybe less than a month. Right, mm -hmm. right. We had not moved in yet you at all. You had a temporary guest. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, work continuing to work with um, you know more custom, one of a kind type pieces like the charm bracelet. Um, 
the pearl thing that that was really getting strong where you know I was designing contemporary looks but using classic pearls and Lori has had a lot of those in the store and probably many of you um, own them and that's something that I really like because it's timeless but there's ways to make it feel fresh and modern as well um, British Vogue, I, I was featured a couple of times in British Vogue during, during the, this is the, just like uh, mid-20-teens, um, always with some new idea. So here it was vintage buttons that we were creating these lariat necklaces with. And then the <laughs> pandemic happened. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and that, as you can imagine, was not a good time for our stores. It wasn't a good time, for, you know, to be... Uh, to be a designer, to be um, you know selling jewelry, the only things that really sold for us were little novelty things like these DIY charm kits, where you know if you're stuck at home with your kids or grandkids, it was something fun to do, um, and mask chains, which we used to call eyeglass chains, but <laughs> they served double duty. So we kind of treaded water for a while, um, but at that point, I made a, a really important decision that has changed my life, not to get too dramatic about it, but um, I decided to step away from being in the wholesale business. And other than Lori and maybe a dozen other uh, top accounts around the country, I, I, wanted to, to, uh, I, I wanted to step off that hamster wheel and stop designing these big collections and put less pressure on, that, on the volume and the speed and just work more, more specialized and more back to my roots in a sense, you know, more artisan and have time for the other things that uh, were important to me. So Bill is on mm -hmm. some Facebook group, vintage Facebook group, and one day he shows me this thing. Um, the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in New York was closing for renovations. They had been sold and they were, they were selling every single item, 16,000 lots were for sale as the hotel cleaned house and started over again. And it was all happening some small auction company up in, in uh, Boston. And when he showed it to me, I'm like, oh my God, I need something from there. That's so me, you know, to buy it. And quickly I thought, okay, it would be a chandelier and use those crystals in a modern way. So I, I did get a chandelier from that auction. I also got a big uh, ginger jar, like a Chinese vessel um, that was slightly chipped. And I, for my purposes, I was thinking I'm going to break it and turn it into mosaic on box lids. So by this point, we're selling through our own website um, and just a little bit to stores, but stores, their heads are elsewhere during the pandemic. So, you know, it wasn't really, it, it made sense the way that we were approaching it. So I was working, my photo the photographer that I was working with was also helping us with social media posts. And look at what a cool project we did together. Okay, these are TikTok videos. So look at the first one. Uh, volume here. that we made from them, um, <coughs> mixing the, um, you know, the fragments of the ginger jar with vintage jewelry that I had in my collection. Those, they sold like that. Oh, and yeah. It was kind of amazing. Cool. And the chandelier jewelry as well um, was 
quite a phenomenon and it was just like a whole new chapter for my business you know where it's something I could never have done selling to stores because it was one chandelier maybe there were 200 crystals on it and when it was done it was done well I'm happy to say that I discovered a couple of antique dealers who also bought chandeliers from that auction and were more than happy to mark them up and sell them to me <laughs> so um, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't quite as economical as the first time, but it meant that this project could go on. And then that one of the dealers, they also had salvaged from the Plaza Hotel, which had closed maybe eight or 10 years before that. And so now I had Plaza Hotel uh, jewelry, chandelier crystals. So I have the bottom shelf of that latrine is all the Grand Hotel jewelry and the, um, the hanging pieces on that beautiful fixture to the right of the, of the shelving unit. So when we're done and, and we're over there, you know, take a look and, and know that every one of those crystals has, you know, what, what has it experienced? What, what happened in those rooms and the, just the vibe and the energy and the history? I mean, it's pretty exciting, you know, that it's not just a piece of fashion jewelry. It's really got history and story. And, and that, to me, that just makes it so much more meaningful. Yeah. The other thing that's been going pretty well in this new chapter of, of my jewelry business is doing custom bracelets. The first one is also a TikTok. Let's see if it works. Yeah. So we do this. Uh, you guys have the opportunity to do it, in a sense, in person today through this charm bar. But for customers online all over the country and, and internationally, you can purchase one of these charm bracelets from our website, and then there's a questionnaire that you fill in with all of the things that matter to you. You know, so in this case, um, you know, the person loved on the left loved gardening, um, her faith. I guess what there were a couple of initials on it. Um, the, a birth month. The pearl disc in the back says mom favorite colors, um, there's you know, a whole bunch of different questions and it's a way very affordably for just a couple of hundred dollars to get a custom charm bracelet, um, you know, like our, our moms or grandmoms would have had, you know, from growing up. Not, not as precious, it's not gold and silver, it's not as expensive either. So that was a great way for me to use my, at this point, 30 plus year archive of charms and materials and resources but speak directly to customers through the internet, which is where you know, my business had evolved to. Now we're up to the portraits. So these are a couple of examples of other portraits. Um, I'll start on the right, because that's, that's another portrait in a box. So this, this I'm calling a portrait in a box. You know, it's a leather, it was a, it held wine in it. It was like for a fancy bottle of wine, and my grandfather must have gotten it as a gift at some point. And um, it was it was around when he died, and it was one of the things that I took. In the case on the right, that's my friend Barbara, and her she's an interior designer, and her aesthetic is very elegant, and she loves Chinese antiques, and she has a big screen in her living room. So I had this idea that a, an antique Chinese box would be an appropriate vessel for her. So one of the things that Lori was encouraging me to do was to present these portraits in a way that, you know, that perhaps would be relevant for you and that, you, that there, are, there are people in your life that you would like to, to commission a portrait about. So I want to just explain how it would work. Um, the stuff inside, I'm kind of counting on you for. Um, although if there's something that you just don't want to part with, don't want it embedded into a collage like this, and it's something that I could purchase you know, a, a copy of or another one, a special, if it's a book or a charm, or like in that case, Barbara told me about the Tiffany's book of table manners for young people and how you know, that was such an important part of how she wanted to raise her kids, but she didn't have the copy anymore. So that was pretty easy. You know, I was able to go on, on uh, Amazon and buy it. Um, the portrait in the middle is of Bill. Bill's uh, career started as a school teacher, then went into um, administration, um, education administration. But the whole thing, I did it on a bulletin board. 
you know, as if it was Mr. Osmond in his classroom. Mr. O or Mr. Osmond? Mr. Osmond, yes. Mr. Osmond. <laughs> and um, as a school teacher, Bill loves holidays and seasonal decor, and he always used to decorate his classroom. So we evoked that in the portrait. Uh, he's an amateur actor, so the red curtain on the right, uh, that's, you know, that's theater. Um, his grandmother and he were very close, and she taught you a lot about um, also holidays and baking. And so it's hard to see in the picture, but in the dead center of the portrait is a spice rack. And that was something that Bill took from his grandparents' home and had it in, you know, in his closet. But suddenly that became the centerpiece of this in the portrait. So those I call framed wall art. Um, so there's a box can be a vehicle or some kind of frame to hang on the wall depending on the materials that, that you have. And then on the left those are built and that's a bell jar. And uh, I love those antique glass bell jars with you know usually it's like butterfly specimens inside it. But in this case the specimens are you know materials that represent a life. So that's my niece, Gavi, who I told you I did her portrait. That's when she was 16 years old. And uh, she loved music. She's sitting on a drum. Uh, she loves uh, Hawaii, so the palm trees. She's a black belt in karate, uh, which so don't mess with her. <laughs> so at the bottom, it's, it's a little, uh, you can't quite see it, but under that red car, is uh, the black belt coiled up, oh, cool. um, and so on and so on. There's you know every single reference. Oh, she loves uh, like Bill. She loves baking and, and uh, cookies in particular. So, so she's, she's standing on top of a cookie, <laughs> <laughs> which she and I made out of uh, when you mix uh, salt, yes. Yes. salt cookie, yeah. right? That yeah. will last forever. So those are bell jars. So each of those three categories has a different price point. Uh, the bell jars are the most um, affordable because they're the least complex. Um, and just to give you an idea, the bell jars are, I just want to get it right, $1,500. The boxes are $3,500. And the framed wall art is $4,000. So that's a different price point than my jewelry. But just to understand, it's, it's something that you're commissioning me to do. So I'm literally you know, blocking the time to source the box or whatever else, to have a couple of Zoom conversations with you to really understand. Like I want this to be you know, like 100 years ago, you would have commissioned a painter and you would have sat you know, for, for sessions that the painter would come and paint you or you'd go to their studio. The painter would get to know you. It's it's quiet. It's personal, and um, and the, the the final result should be something you know just absolutely spectacular, one of a kind that you pass on to the next generation. That's that's my hope in doing all of this, and um, and doing it for people who I don't know really well is a pretty that's new to my journey. So, Lori has I mean Lori and I know each other fairly well, but Lori has offered has asked to commission one of her mother, who you all knew. And um, we're gonna, when, when I'm done talking, Lori's gonna come up and we gather, she gathered some objects for a portrait of Rosie, and I'm gonna just walk you through how we've been talking about it um, as an example to inspire you, you know, if it's the right thing for you. And if not, just enjoy it as art and, um, you know, as an interesting experience. Okay, moving on. So. For my own fine art, now when I was here last time, it was in October of 2019, the next month I was um, putting this show on display. This is called The Women, and these were portraits of the women in my life, and actually these came before this, because I was doing, these were life-size portraits, using mannequins and um, a lot of construction with wood to create almost like, a, it was almost like a party, you know, with these 20 women kind of scattered in the space and you just kind of walked around and you got to know them and you you know by looking at the different objects that I that I made it out of you got to know those women a little bit. It was an incredible experience. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. It was pretty exciting, I have to say. It was and 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 you know working on it. I mean, I still had very much my day job with jewelry, so it was a 6-year project, you know, doing doing these portraits you know, on nights, weekends, working. Each one of them was a collaboration, the same way I'm talking about for these. 
but with that woman, you know, first meeting, uh, having almost like an interview, getting to know them a little more, their backgrounds, then identifying things that matter to them, you know, in terms of their careers, in terms of their families, their hobbies, um, and then trying to cajole them into giving me those things to create the portraits with, or buying facsimiles. So, and oh, and then the other thing I forgot to say is that in each case, once I heard and like absorbed what, what they were about, it was like, well, how do I, what, what's the transformation? What am, what am I creating? What, what's the armature? Uh, what's the big idea? So the, the one with the blue hair on the right, that was my niece, Gavi, at 12 years old. Yeah. And she was obsessed with, um, with Katy Perry at the time. <laughs> that blue wig was her Halloween costume that year. She was really into the TV show Glee, and that big foam finger was from Glee. Mm -hmm. And so I had this idea of, you know, of a mannequin. She had a scooter she loved. So, you know, it was like Gavi in motion. And again, I could spend, you know, an hour just talking about the women show because every one of these portraits was a big was a big old story. It was really well received in Philadelphia. And, you know, for so long people knew me just as a jewelry designer. So you know, bit by bit, as I've had more of my fine artwork on display, I'm starting to get known as an artist, as a fine artist as well. And that is just very gratifying for me. Um, and I'm really glad that I got this show in just under the, um, in the nick of time, because a few months later, COVID, back to that whole story. John, is this in the second floor of your studio? No, this was yet? at a gallery yeah. called In Liquid um, in, in North Philadelphia. <coughs> More recently, last November, um, I had a show called Whiskey Rebellion, and this actually has another Bill connection. Yeah. Bill is like my stuff muse. <laughs> we, actually, our very first date, we went flea marketing together, so mm -hmm. it just shows you we, like, we, we love doing that together, and that's uh, one of the reasons Bill came on this trip, because when I told him, you know, two days at Round Top in Warrington, and then a day at the store, he's like, yeah, yeah sign me up. <laughs> <laughs> so Bill's godmother had inherited a collection of some 300 figurative whiskey decanters from the 1960s. Wow. And some of them like that, the man on the horse, and, and these guys, oops, and these guys were um, you know, shaped like revolutionary war heroes because it was a collectible marketed to men, it was whiskey, and the marketing companies at Jim Beam Whiskey and their competitors back then were probably thinking, you know, well, what would men relate to? Oh, men like, you know, our military. And, um, you know, revolutionary war heroes and our presidents, George Washington, uh, this guy, uh, General Stark. Let me think of You see the one from New Hampshire? Yeah, he, he was, uh, the most famous uh, officer in New Hampshire and one of the founders of the New Hampshire colony. Um, on the right, that's the 1st Pennsylvania Battalion. Those were um, you know, a band of soldiers who helped fight the Revolutionary War. So she also had birds and states and uh, Hollywood actors and um, you know, Laurel and Hardy, like a zillion different things. So when she passed away um, a, year, a year and some ago, Bill was um, the executor of her estate, and he was trying to figure out what to do with all these bottles. So, of course, the first person he came to was me, and he said, John, are you, is, are you interested in anything? Well, I was really taken by these, um, these American Revolutionary War figures, for the most part, some other ones too, but my first idea was um, I really liked the tension between you know, what's, what's considered masculine and then what's feminine, and for being a guy designing jewelry, but, um, you know, it, it just, like, it's ripe for people to, to consider and, and to be either amused by or ask questions about. Mm -hmm. So first I thought, oh, I'm just going to put some jewelry on them, and that'll be really funny. <laughs> but then I started getting more into it. I was like, well, these are real people with real histories, and I feel like it's kind of just taking the easy way out to just embellish them. Like, I want to know more about them, and then the embellishments, I want them to be meaningful. So, in a nutshell, I realized that this whole story was about what is a hero? And in the 1700s, these guys were heroes. 
in the 1960s, they were still heroes because, you know, at least according to the marketing executives at the whiskey companies, <laughs> oh, these are heroes that people will want to own these bottles. But today, in 2023, and this was last year, you know, are they heroes by the, same, by the values that are important to me today? Um, you know, as a gay man, well, how would they have felt about that as a Jewish person? How do they feel about women? How do they feel about black people? You know, like on so many levels, the, the conversation in our culture today is so much more complicated than it was in the 60s and certainly you know, 300 years ago. And not that you can impose today's values on the past, but as an artist, it's, I also felt like I can't just ignore it and I can't just throw some jewelry on them and be done with it. So my, my solution was to just bring it all up and bring it up it's a little hard to see in these photos, but I bought a lot of like badges and buttons and pins that said things about all of those minority groups that I just mentioned, and you know, women's rights or human rights and that kind of thing. Um, and I and I embellished their outfits with those kinds of um, materials as well as jewelry, um, instead of a pedestal that was made out of marble or bronze. My pedestals are books kind of provocative books, like for George Washington, those, are, those were from my business shelf, because I'm a businessman, so I have a shelf of business books, wrench in the system, first break all the rules. I thought, well, George Washington, he was doing that. So I like the idea of making these old, old timey things modern through you know, the choices that I make. So that's another version of portraiture, um, you know, working with the past, but through the lens of, of, uh, of my life. And I had the opportunity to install it in a brand new hotel in Philadelphia that has an artist in residence program um, where every month they invite a different artist to hang work or install it in the hotel. And this, so this is the hotel's lobby with these bookcases. And I, I just thought I could see it, you know, the figures in these cubbies. But then because the, each uh, shelf was so long and, and um, so yeah. so horizontal, narrow, thank you. Um, I made these camouflage panels to add a little extra um, interest to sort of define the show. And then also camouflage kind of went along with my theme because you know it used to be very macho and masculine. And now it's like, I see Lori has her camo, uh, you know, accessories. And like, we all love camo, but not necessarily for the reasons that it was originally created. And so I bought pink camo and blue and green and, you know, it was sort of, uh, again, just having, having some fun at the stereotypes of what these things represent through a more modern perspective. We got camo socks. <laughs> <laughs> yes, as a gift. That was great. We're going to be fighting over those. <laughs> All right, a little, just a little uh, sidebar to just share about my mom because she was a really important part of my, uh, my life, both obviously as my mom, but also as an inspiration uh, to be an artist. Um, so this, so she started welding, like a very macho thing, you know, working with the TIG welder and with the helmet and um, finding scrap metal at scrap metal yards and flea markets and putting them together in these surprisingly elegant and whimsical compositions. Meanwhile, she loved fashion and accessories, and she was very, uh, you know, beautifully groomed. And like, it was a little bit of, uh, huh, she made that? <laughs> People were always surprised. I so love there, that picture on the right. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. This is uh, also from the 80s, her and me at one of her shows. Well, it was somebody else's paintings and her sculptures in the gallery. And then that on the right was us, maybe the year she, the year a year before she passed away. She's already wearing, you know, a cancer wig and kind of poignant. So as I mentioned before, when she passed away, we started uh, the Dina Wood <coughs> Art Foundation. She and my dad, and my dad is alive and well at 85. Uh, he's in Philadelphia, and we're really close. Uh, and he and my mom always were to the best as much as they could afford to, they were very generous in supporting the arts, and mostly in Philadelphia. So we created this foundation to kind of create a more uh, organized, um, 
losing the word there, but we just wanted to, to, to do something that was more like professional to continue that philanthropy uh, now and then you know into the future. And my niece is now 19, she's on the board of the foundation and uh, I'm the president of it. And the, so we have two goals. Um, one is to continue to promote Dina's art, um, her, her professional reputation and her artwork. And the second is to continue to support the philanthropy that my parents uh, was so important to them. And, and it doesn't have to be just to the organizations that they supported, but rather just the spirit of the power of art to uh, impact lives and um, you know, make the world a better place. So that's the third piece of my, uh, my third hat that I, that I juggle and why it's so good that I don't go to train shows anymore because it gives me more time to do all of these things. The second floor of our building uh, houses this gorgeous display of her sculptures, and it's a very open space that is uh, conducive to events. So at least once a month, we have an event there. Ne next week, um, 50 people are coming for a panel discussion about fierce women mural artists in Philadelphia. The Mural Arts is a great organization that um, <coughs> has created more murals in Philadelphia than I think anywhere in the country. Um, they came to see the studio and to talk about how we could collaborate. And uh, the director of the organization said, well, your mom was such a fierce artist. Why don't we talk about fierce mural art, women mural artists? So something like that, it's you know a couple of hours. I always try to include, we start downstairs, there's a cocktail, there's some jewelry shopping. We donate 25% of any jewelry sales that night to the organization, whatever it is. Um, then we go upstairs and there's refreshments and Bill is in charge of hospitality, so that's uh, another way that he contributes to our, our foundation. And there's the program, there's reception, the space is really beautiful, so it's just been a you know, very cool way to evolve, taking just you know, all the different aspects of, of my, uh, my career and finding the synergies between them. And when I shared this, this um, presentation with Lori in advance. She said, I'm so excited that you're, sh you're telling your whole story, not just you know, one of those stories. And I feel like at this point in my life, that's what it's about, of finding you know, as many ways as possible to, to bring all of these things together. This is just a cool thing for you to see. Um, Grounds for Sculpture, a sculpture park in New Jersey. Um, in New Jersey, yeah. Mm -hmm. Awesome. <laughs> 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 New Jersey Exit too. nine. <laughs> <laughs> so they um, they reached out to us. They wanted to do. It's all big sculptors or many big sculptors at this park, and they really felt that, that Dina, as an early, you know, lady who welds, uh, kind of a maverick artist, deserved some uh, attention. So we took a 26-inch sculpture of hers and this foundry on the facility at Grounds for Sculpture enlarged it to 26 feet. <laughs> Here's a guy working on it. You can see that the wheel that he's welding, each of those spokes, which you can see in the picture on the right, originally that was just a found object that Dina found at some flea market or, or um, scrap metal yard. But at 26 feet, nothing is just a found object. You have to <laughs> create it from scratch. Wow. And that's the final product. Wow. wow. It's so beautiful. Yeah. So just as a per little personal aside, last November, actually a year and a half ago, November 7th. Um, I proposed to Bill in front of my mom's sculpture. Aww. And Aww. next year, we're going to get married in front of the sculpture. Aww. So, Aww. so Aww. she'll be with us, you know, in spirit. Yes. Okay, finally, yesterday, <laughs> we, the last two days we were in, in Warrington, as you heard, and um, you know I was shopping for things for my art, for things for the charm bar, uh, for things for our home, like, you know, it's, it kind of everything goes, and it was really fun to be inspired. The, um, the middle one is this Belgian, this Belgian guy who has these beautiful farm animal uh, trophies you were looking at it before. So I bought a few and they're right over there. <clears throat> so there's way more, that, no more pictures in the presentation, but there's a ton of charms that we bought together. The charm bar, there's chains hanging, so we can um, you know, take a couple of charms that speak to you and cluster them together at the bottom of a chain, or if, if Lori calls them 
uh, carriers, mm -hmm. the chain carriers. If you have chains already um, and you just want the charms, the charms are like the, you know, the, the important part. Um, but I can help you figure out what to do with them. And uh, the rest of the day, we'll, we'll talk about your mom's portrait a little bit now. And then after that, and also when we do that, Lisa was very proactive and <laughs> Lori gave her some advance word and um, she brought in some materials that we're gonna create a portrait about her parents. And maybe I'll just talk about that yeah. for a second. Do, you, do, you wanna, do we wanna move, uh, move it up? Um, so it's in the camera? Yeah. So really not knowing exactly what you know what we were going to do lisa just gathered some things about her parents you know from a belt buckle to just this little uh, decorative object that was meaningful for her this is a photocopy of a, of a framed photo but i asked if i could have the framed photo itself because you can imagine it would just be a really meaningful centerpiece um, I also have to show you guys later, just to thumb through it, some more examples of pieces that I've done. So this box is the one that seems like it would be the best shape for Lisa. And I'll find a box, you know, antiquing one day. She explained your, your parents weren't too flashy, so keep it sort of simple and really draw, focus the energy on the, on the materials. So, you know, the stuff that ends up in your drawers and you don't know what to do with, Come to me. <laughs> that's, that's what it's all about. Or just like that really special Polaroid. Yeah, you know, it's too too good to to put in a drawer or even in an album. Old car key. I love that. That's oh, yeah. you know, that's so meaningful. Piece of jewelry. Jewelry because of my you know dual career, jewelry is always everywhere. I love putting jewelry into portraits. Um, you know, things about faith, this little guardian angel, mm -hmm. pets. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Lisa and her dogs. <laughs> My mom. Uh, this is a cool little, just something that would have sat on your dad's desk. Yep. So oh. I will, however I mount it, I'll make sure that you can still play with it. <laughs> <laughs> so my feedback was that this is, you know, excellent. And if anything, I could just use a little more, you know, yeah. because you can see how densely it gets packed. Unless you want something cleaner and more minimal, and then it would just affect the kind of box or the kind of wall art that we end up creating. No, or there's or plenty more. Jar. There's yeah. plenty more. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So now, Lori, should we talk about your mom's portrait for a minute? Sure, I want to take this really good photo. Did, before that, does anyone have any questions? That was a lot. A lot of information there. I just have one question. When did your mom start welding? What year? 1978. That's a great year. That was pretty early. We <laughs> <laughs> were born that year at Crystal Bowl. That's right. Did she teach herself? or? Uh, no. She went, there was an art school in Philadelphia um, that had welding classes. She did that. Well, a girlfriend who she, she started as a painter. So first she painted um, abstract painting. And a friend she made in the painting class said, you know, I've been welding as well, and just showed her what that was all about. And somehow, it's like my mom and I have the same gene. She, it, was, it wasn't as natural for her to create, to paint on a blank canvas. That was a little intimidating. But working with existing materials and finding these artistic compositions, it just was like you know, immediate. She, she um, gravitated to it right away. And within a year or two, she stopped painting and devoted herself to sculpture. Then she took a serious class, like you know, that bridge welders would take, so that she really understood, you know, how to do it in a in a serious way. And then she eventually opened her own uh, studio where she rented the you know, the tanks <laughs> and bought the equipment that she needed. So yeah, my mom was this lady welder. <laughs> Wonderful, that's cool. Yeah. Okay, Lori, what have you got? Okay. Well, we're going to start with my mom's purse because um, to me there's nothing almost more personal to a lady than her handbag. And uh, this was a concept that I really loved since I've known John eight years and my mother adored him. Um, I was able, I had the privilege to see a lot of this unfolding in his life. David and I went to Philly and we had um, visited 
um, the uh, actual welding studio that was his mother's, and John had um, the women's exhibition uh, kind of pre-set up there, and so we had the opportunity to view that in its original space, and um, so I knew I wanted to commemorate my mom even before she passed away with kind of an homage in this way. So I chose her purse first, um, just because, like I said, I feel like it's such a personal expression uh, of each of us. And I love it because my mom always said that your wallet expresses your financial uh, organization. But I definitely got my creativity. <laughs> like, I definitely You're got my mess. creativity from You're this, this in her purse. Her wallet is still intact in here. I have her whole purse exactly like it was. It smells like her. I love it. Um, and uh, but so her her wallet high and tight. But this sucker inside here, I pulled out all kind of goodies because she really carried a lot of things with her. Um, she was a minimalist in many ways but she had um, a beauty to her that just, you know, the most important thing is if you knew my mother, she never went anywhere without lipstick and all mm -hmm. of a sudden the lipstick is missing. Oh, there it is, good. She never went anywhere without lipstick and, uh, and it wasn't even a Mary Kay lipstick, but it's okay, <laughs> I never gave her for that. So, and then she was a white diamonds girl. She oh, always yeah. smelled like white diamonds and, and she had, uh, people who always gave her white diamonds, so there was never a shortage of it. So she always had her purse, and she always had some every anyway. But uh, my mother was also a brooch person, and uh, I really expected to find a brooch in here. I didn't. Uh, at one point, we were kind of even talking about maybe using her purse as the vessel, but the story just kept growing and growing. And so um, I did find, I think, three of her favorites. Like this one, she wore so much it's missing a lot of the little um, rhinestones from it. But this, it was elegant, but sim, you know, simple. She had a simplistic way about her. Uh, this was a Christmas present from John one year. It was a John Wynn Christmas brooch, and she loved it. It was among her favorites. And then she was a patriot. She uh, loved her country, and she had a flag on a lot of the time. Uh, if she had a, her red jacket on, she had a flag on it. And um, so these were things, and then um, somehow I was lucky enough that in all of her things, I still have an R, I don't know when she wore this in her life, uh, but I still have her 14 karat gold uh, R. Uh, because she, cause it stands for Rosie, even though, um, <laughs> yeah, so I, I love that. But um, a couple other things that became significant. Uh, I, my, you know, my mom struggled with her health for years and years and years, and my husband David and I traveled long, but, you know, even before we married. So I have lit 22 candles in 22 different countries in 22 different churches, Catholic churches. Um, so we'll have a candle. Um, this one was out with a little cardinal at the holidays in my kitchen. And so uh, we'll find something, whether it's that or not. So I think of all the years my mother worked in the oil and the gas industry, she was uh, the only woman. She did a lot of uh, Im impressive things and she never bragged about them. And you can tell they appreciated her so much. She got this fancy keychain. <laughs> so it's one of the only accommodations I can see that she got. Uh, but it says Conoco on it. And uh, she had a long career with Conoco uh, through its various names over many years. Um, I also have several rosaries of hers. Uh, this happens to be one. I'm in particular looking for the one I brought her from the Czech Republic with Czech crystals because um, we, her she married into a Czech family, so all of her kids are half Czech. And I don't have that particular one, but um, I have I have three rosaries that I have found. And then um, how many of you had shrimp earrings? Right. Yeah. I still have so I was telling John, I was like, you know, she always had her shrimp earrings on. And uh, I can't find them. I brought them back from the ranch, and they're in some fine jewelry. So I've got to, I've got it tucked away somewhere. So, but if she didn't have her shrimp earrings on, she often had this pair of John Wynn earrings on. Mm -hmm. And I love these. I gifted these to her because in John's handwriting, they say bold, love, and inspire. And she was definitely bold. Um, she was definitely an inspiration, and she loved everyone unconditionally. Uh, if you were in her life and significant to her, there was no doubt. I mean, there was there were never any conditions or stipulations. So that was something. Um, let's see. Okay. 
this still goes back to her faith too. Candy, my mom was a Brock's candy lover. I'm gonna, I'm probably gonna have to find mostly peppermint. And these came out of her purse. <laughs> they're, 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 she's, they're, they're still candy in there. You're gonna have to get the plastic one. So I'm gonna have to, yeah, I'm gonna have to get a, a plastic one. But uh, so my mom, you know, was a Catholic, and uh, so we'll do something with the rosary. Mm -hmm. But toward the end of her life, when she was losing her vision. Um, she had kind of a particular view from her bed and her favorite colors were blue and white. And so I hung this on her wall so that, cause she prayed to the Virgin Mary as a, as a Catholic. And uh, so she really loved this. David and I bought this at San Fernando Cathedral in San Antonio. Um, we just went and spent the day as tourists and uh, stayed down on the river. And so I found that and I found a priest there and he blessed it. And so we hung it in her room. And so that was a, a sentimental piece and it was her favorite colors. Um, I uh, love this picture of her. I found this recently. Uh, as her children, and just in general, even amongst my mom, we always talked about when she was going to heaven uh, that she was going to be free of all these things that her flesh was burdened with, right? Look at How that. Was she? I don't know. But um, I just love it. So just beautiful. She was still witty, so. Uh, and so this is how we see my mom in heaven. That looks like her. Um, she she can run. Uh, she's perfectly, and you know, everything about her physical condition and her flesh is just perfection. And I'll and, put that in a little frame to preserve mm -hmm. it. Uh -huh. Yeah, so. That's her engagement and Okay, so we're gonna well, we're gonna David's looking already for some things, but I just love this. So, but it gets better because Bill and I are kind of off the wall. So I will say I have I've had a little bit of an un, unusual experience because of my connection to Bill. That over the last couple of days, while we were also in Round Talk, we had the ability to continue to talk about this. So this has been an ongoing, you know, maybe a couple year conversation here and there, but then more so. Uh, in greater detail of recent. But um, probably one of the most interesting facets that I think, and I just got, my sister was here the other day, and Oops. I was telling her, swivels, I was telling her about my idea, and she's like, oh. No. That's so sick. <laughs> she's like, you're gonna use a bell? She didn't have a very good marriage. <laughs> and, uh, and she didn't have 100% uh, of the time enjoyable marriage. They're just tough. But she, um, I, I had this idea. What my mom did was my mom loved her job and it defined her and it was the way she provided for us. And so I was telling my sister that I really wanted to use mom's hard hat in this oh. art thing. She's like, are you kidding? And I was like, no, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna discuss it with John. But we're thinking that we're gonna use her hard hat. Um, and so we found this in Warren, we found this in Warrington yesterday. So we're thinking we're going to use our heart. Is it okay? I'm going to give it to you. Don't tell details away. No, no. Uh, you John, would you like to talk since this is your show? <laughs> uh, so early on, I, bro I broke her hard hat yesterday when I was pulling it out yesterday. But John said, "Don't worry. We'll put some. We'll put some crystals on that." Uh, so, uh, so this is her hard hat. All these years that she worked, uh, you know, not so much in the management position that she ultimately ended up with. But this is when she was on the floor and in and out uh, working amongst uh, all men. You know, she went to work every day at 6 a.m. And um, So one of the things I was explaining to my sister, from my perspective, my mom was married to her job. But she was married to her job because it was how she provided for us. It's how she took care of us. And so I thought, I think it'll be so funny if we put her wedding veil yeah. on her hat. Because that was one of our hats. Because it was a big role. And uh, through this protection, this hard hat, is how she protected us as our mother. Yeah. And so we're going to try to figure out some way to put her wedding, her wedding veil. She, I think she's really laughing. Go on, Laurie. But it's funny. And so I just love it. So it's so mine and Bill's relationship. And John, John. I'm John Johnson. Bill well, the bills too. Yeah, but it's, it's really, uh, this is so typical of something that John and I and our friendship and our interactions. So then my mother had a, like, she didn't wear a lot of this. She had all this costume jewelry. Oh, so you're going to use that? So we're going to use, use so I spent every Sunday with my mom. And so one day I pulled this all out, and so I just painstakingly separated it all. Some pieces are broken. So I gathered them all up, so they're all in baggies. Like, look yeah. how this would look so great. 
Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. oh, oh wow. wow. Yeah. And so my mom, it was an, she had an inner diva. I mean, she really yeah. did. Um, and so, um, anyway, so we're either going to uh, put her shrimp earrings on or we'll put her John Wayne earrings on. But um, I just think it's, it's a good beginning. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's yeah. getting bigger. Yeah. Than we initially planned. Uh, so we're not exactly sure. I'm gonna, uh, You're going to have to have a big box. And then a big suitcase. The, the next step, yeah, we'll have to ship it back for sure. But the next step is okay, well, there's all these other objects. What would, what would, hold, what would support it all? Maybe some kind of shelf or a little cabinet. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that goes outside of the, the models that I showed you. But, you know, depending, that's kind of part of a, of a commission is depending on the materials that I have to work with. We brainstorm yeah, and mm -hmm. like, well, once I heard the hard hat and the veil idea, I was like, okay, we have to go in that direction because <laughs> it's so unique and it's so rosy and it looks so good. I, this is the first time I'm seeing it is all it, together. I've got it. Oh, yes. Okay. And I love her names on the front of it. And uh, so she also loved tapestries. And so I pulled out, I unboxed one of them. Uh, and I'll go through them. She also has uh, one that has a little boy and a little girl. She was a romantic at heart. And um, I don't know, all depending on what we get, I may have you line part of it with a tapestry. Oh, and cool. um, Cedar chest. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah. right. But so we just wanted to kind of walk through this process. So that you can kind of understand uh, if there's somebody in your life that you want to build a happy, um, I, I call it a homage to, I mean, we've all lost, but um, I don't know, I just, um, we thought that if we could show you how we've slowly built Rosie's um, and that, you know, there's a little bit of satire in there. There's, um, she was a very funny person. I know y'all, if you knew her well, you knew she was hilarious, uh, but very dry. So, um, so it'll, you'll see it as it continues to unfold, and once it's complete, it'll probably be in here for, yeah. for quite some time uh, before I take it home or anything like that. But um, anyway, so that, this was part of our vision board. Yeah. And uh, the other the, the last thing I told John was that I thought it would be so cool, since this is really how my siblings and I see her. This is actually a little bit younger than we were actually thinking of, but I told him recently, it's like, oh my God, I found this really great picture of her, and I know this is what she looks like in heaven. We talked about Deca blowing this up and decoupaging this, oh, yeah. uh, so that her true yeah. face is on there. Oh, that was so wow. that's probably the thing that excites me the most. I can't decide if it's a little freaky or if it would. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, I'm sure she's looking down, going, "What?" <laughs> <laughs> so, she said, anyway. "What are you doing?" I know, I know. But but honestly, she's. I think she's loving it. Yes, she's she it. was. And she loved you. She adored you. I have lots of pictures of John and my mother together. And that's because uh, when he was here, uh, the two times he was, she would say, now you be sure that you get a photo of us. <laughs> and so therefore we have, we have several photos of them together. But okay, sounds good. So our, our plan now is for you guys to just enjoy, stand up, explore, shop, um, ask me questions. Um, the chairs there, we're gonna move them away so we can pull the charm bar out. In the center. Um, there's trays on, on this table, um, if you'd like to you know, gather some things. Does anyone want to give him a little applause? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Such a master of his trade and so humble. So thank you for yes. showing Very him that you know Andy Warhol and that you were on the cover of magazines. And so now part of your uh, opportunity here is to have this one-on-one -on -one time with him or in a group. And so of course, if you are interested in a commission, we definitely, you know, he'll definitely want to talk with you initially. Uh, but then we would do follow-up. So 